Thanks for that warm welcome. Thanks <laughs> for everybody for coming. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Um, you have a, a book about Shakespeare that's out recently, coming out in paperback. The Quality of Mercy, and that is entirely about Shakespeare. And I tried to write a book in which many different things. First, my conviction that all possible theories that Shakespeare didn't exist or didn't write Shakespeare are completely idiotic, <laughs> laughable, and but it debates. <laughs> Thank you. There could be a little uh, more applause. <laughs> there may be some doubters there. <laughs> but it has become an industry. If you write, if you have, because there are 50 claimants at least at this moment, and if you get, make it your career to take this one, I say, but Dan really wrote Shakespeare, and I can really prove this to you. And then I get other people to do it, and we do a whole university course of it. And then we write books about it. That is giving enormous trade to printers, to, to rival universities, to start a counter course, and it is an industry. But anyway, that's part of this book. The other part is speaking from very many different experiences with plays that I've been involved in. But the purpose is for once, I think, not for once, but to write a book about Shakespeare that is not academic and is not and is entertaining and light and readable and almost like a spoken book rather than a discourse on Shakespeare, which is what I dread most. Uh, just to get back to the, the, the industry, uh, aside from the, the need to create this industry, what is it about people that, that offer these theories? What, is, what drives them? Why do people want to believe that it was not Shakespeare? Well, <clears throat> this I quote in the book, that Jean Genet once said to me, he said, you know, you must recognize that we writers are by nature jealous, and we can't bear somebody who has too much success, and what a relief <coughs> it is if we can prove that it wasn't he who wrote it, but his cousin. <laughs> and he said, for a moment, that lets us off a hook until gradually somebody begins to prove that the cousin really was a great writer, and then we are stuck, and so we have to prove that that's else. false, and so, yeah. so the industry goes on. You, you once said something interesting before in another, for, or another area, that, that you're never bored by television, because something's always going on, but you can be very bored in the theater. Not quite in that way. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Not I'm uh, boiling Not it down quite. a bit too much, but, but what did no, you No, I, I just said, I think, that on a screen, and that's why movies were called movies, something moves, and that curiously, as long as the picture is moving, the eye is with it, and you're not completely bored, unless that has the effect of putting you to sleep. <laughs> but in the theater, if there isn't life going on in one subtle way or another, sometimes, I mean, like in a balletic theater, it's in big movements of the body, and another, it's in the listening, and the something that you really feel happening between two people in the, I mean, look at Beckett's plays, Beckett, which is really extraordinary. If you look at the printed page of any Beckett play, you'll find that every two or three words, there's a little gap and the same word in brackets, it just says pause, little pause. And he was writing, Pinter did likewise, and Chekhov did it differently. He did it with three, three dots of suspension but it's the same thing. Something is said, and there's a pause before the next thing comes out. Of it. And that's where it's flowing all the time. And you also talked about that in terms of movement, yeah. that before every movement there's a preparation. Ah, uh, yes. Before you, I, I think, again, in Brook by Brook, you, you show how one extends one's arm. Mm. One starts here, extends, and then and I remember when afterwards. Simon was so, five or six years old, he would always say before jumping this French phrase, which is from a petit élan. He'd say a petit élan, and then he'd jump. <laughs> and it's 
it's always that moment of suspension. You also talk a lot about the tightrope as a metaphor yes. for acting. Yeah. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. On the tightrope, you put one foot down, you find the balance on that foot, and you move on to the left foot, and there's a temptation and the danger always of going too far to one side, too far to the other, so that's a balance you have to take. But you know perfectly well that there's another law of gravity that if in doing this you actually pause, imagine if that man crossing from one skyscraper to the other actually stopped for a moment and say to himself, how am I doing? He falls instantly. So you have to keep moving. But what gives you a motive for moving is that you know where you're going. If you once lose sight, so some of your real concentration is going this way, that way, on the inner sense of balance, the need to move forward, and a goal. If you haven't got that goal, it may be as simple as just, I say, an open window and somebody beckoning you, you or the end of the tightrope. Not only you can't, but if one wants to make this dynamic and creatively alive for an audience, that also gives that possibility of the tempo not being boringly regular, but something that you draw back, you go a little farther forward, you stop, you rediscover it, and then you see your aim is calling you, and off you go again. Hmm. And is that obviously translation to something more than movement? You're talking about how, how a drama is enacted on a stage. Well, that is what drama is all about. I mean, it, drama is human beings, but it's human beings in living an idea, an, a situation, a relationship with other people, a very powerful and perhaps excessive or inadequate s strong feeling, all that intertwining at every second. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You also mention freedom in this context. That well, that's uh, inseparable, yeah. If you're not free, imagine you're not free and you're trying to do something, you fall off the tightrope right away. Yeah. That link between the pure imagination and the body itself. Mm -hmm. How do you create that link? <laughs> I don't create it. <laughs> But so how does what how does no? But it comes about like everything, everything good. There is you know what's called what uh, that's called the beginner's mind, where something is so completely unexpected, and that happens often at a first rehearsal, an improvisation, or even at an audition. Suddenly, everything swept away, and whoo, it emerges, and then that beginner's freshness, like the innocence that has to lead into experience in life, that then has to be, one has to go through the mill. And here the mill is all sorts of hard work, the whole process of going, of what is the whole of rehearsal process in a theater? Trial and error. And going through that with hopes, disappointments, mistakes, and that grinding produces once again that sudden moment when Everything drops, and I've often found a very, very curious phenomenon. People often, very kindly and misguidedly, give me enormous praise for something which is completely unfair, because it, what has really happened is that the most difficult scene that one's worked and worked on and everyone has contributed, and one can never get right. And I've known that in the moment of despair, perhaps the day before the opening, and even on rare occasions, a few hours before the opening, or a few minutes, suddenly it falls into place. And everyone says, how difficult that was, what time it must have spent, but thinking that there has been worked out and dictated, not at all. And they all, great musicians say, the music plays you, you don't play the music. It's the same with acting. If it's possible to step outside of yourself and look around at the world of theater, do you see some sort of lasting effect that you've had with your, with your work? God forbid. Yeah. Is, it, is it possible to do that? Is there, is there... I'm, how do I step out of myself? <laughs> I, I do know that um, 
Truman Capote loved saying, look, I'm beside myself, and he would do a little jump. Like that. <laughs> but I unfortunately <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> There's Nothing, I can't, can't draw you out on that, okay. No. <laughs> and I hate generalizing. So you don't like to generalize talk it? About, yeah, about the theater, the state of the theater, what it could be, what it would be, what it is, 